morning. Thanks for joining us on Dialogue, a program that engages topical issues that are potentials of shaping the project in Nigeria. My name is Shafiu Suleiman. Um, Nigeria is said to be in a turbulent situation, in turbulent times due to the uh, challenges you know, drawing the country backward. A country that has potentials you know, of being among the top economies, uh, at least top, te uh, top 10 or top 20 economies by now. Now, the recent uh, paper delivered by an erudite uh, doctor, talking about Dr. Usman Bukaji, uh, they uh, just concluded 25th anniversary of the second felony of Lagos uh, with the title Nigeria in Turbulent Times Pathways to Peaceful Coexistence and National Cohesion uh, has set a template for discussion among uh, political elites and, of course, uh, critical thinkers uh, who want Nigeria uh, to attain that height that is desirable of. Um, any nation that has such potentials uh, like Nigeria. Now, in that paper, uh, Dr. Usman Bugaji has, uh, you know, raised a fundam some fundamental issues that have to do with what uh, is making Nigeria to remain where it is today, uh, despite all of those potentials we talked about. And he talked about uh, the fact that uh, uh, even more trouble times are ahead of us, looking at where we are in terms of our growing population and, of course, our declining uh, economic growth. So he sort of uh, just opposed, you know, the, the, our rising population vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, slow pace of our economic development. He also talked about uh, some of the uh, reasons behind uh, our inability to achieve genuine uh, national cohesion and, of course, national um, peaceful coexistence. He talked about uh, the absence of nationalism, you know, which has given way to ethnicity and, and all of that. Um, again, he talked about Nigeria losing the fight against corruption, which is fundamental. Now, uh, despite the initial... Um, believe you know that the present administration or President Muhammadu Buhari as a person um, may have possessed the political will you know to deal with the issue of corruption in Nigeria. Uh, recent statistics and recent um, happenings are uh, pointing otherwise. So these are some of the issues raised in that paper that we'll be looking at this morning. And I'm joined by another erudite development economist talking about. Uh, Dr. Obadia Milapia. He is a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. He was also a former presidential candidate. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning and great nation, good people. All right. Uh, just like trying to do a little bit of recap, you know, about that paper, but it is much more than what I said, actually. Sure. I'm sure you've read the paper. Very thought provoking. Yes, I read the paper and. Uh, Usman Bugaji is somebody I know quite well, I'm quite friendly, we're very friendly with each other, and he is a very erudite um, public intellectual. Uh, as you know, he has a background uh, in philosophy, and actually his PhD was in the history of science. Uh, so he is he's, he's intellectually well-grounded. I read his, his public lecture, and um, I, I think he raised a number of very pertinent issues. Uh, of course, the th that the country uh, seems to be going in the wrong direction, obviously. And uh, he paints a very bleak scenario of the future, right. uh, echoing the African-American writer uh, James Baldwin, who says that the most dangerous person you can ever find is someone who has nothing to lose. Right. And the population of those who have nothing to lose, mm. the young people, is getting to almost 70% of the population. Mm. And increasingly, they have nothing to do. Mm. Increasingly. And it's, we 
was sitting on the powder keg and I completely share his sense of urgency and also the concern about the quality of leadership. Mm. That the whole political system is positioned in such a manner that it generates, it, it doesn't bring up the best 11. Mm. It brings up actually the worst 11, uh, to use the language of football. Yeah, in, in uh, terms of uh, leadership capacity. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, when we were students at Oxford uh, from Kenya, told me that don't enter African politics until you have the heart to kill a human being. And you should be prepared to kill a human being without even thinking about it. That's quite sad. If you don't have that kind of mind, mm. don't enter politics. Mm. That's what he told me. Mm. And uh, I didn't believe him. Mm. Uh, and uh, But you see, the kind of people that we are seeing uh, going into po politics are people that are very crookish, mm. very heartless, and, uh, and, you know, have no qualms about doing anything for them and justifies the means. Right. And uh, yeah. they overshadow people like us and Bugaji oh. who come from the world of ideas and, and who believe that justice is possible and that human progress oh. can be achieved by people of goodwill. Yeah. And, and people who believe truly in non-violence and in peace yeah. uh, and in fairness for all. Right. So anyway, these are the issues that mm. he raised, and I, I I agreed with him. I disagreed with him on one or two issues, mm. but yeah, we'll mm. perhaps we we'll look at that. Yes, <laughs> it's more like critiquing the papers. Well. Yes, yeah, but then just like we said, he has set a template for discussion. Exactly. Um, let's look at the economic aspect of it. He was really concerned about the ratio mm. you know, of our economic growth sure. versus sure. the rate of our Population. population. Sure. Now, while the population is growing at 3%, yes. the, 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 the economic growth is, is running below 2%. Yes. Now, how do we reconcile this? If we really want to address those fundamental issues mm. he raised, mm. because that is a starting line. Yes, you see, Manu Shafi, there was a period of almost 10 years from around 2004 to around 2014, where growth was virtually averaging 7%, or near that. Uh, and uh, uh, it was not magic. It was because we enjoyed a period of relative peace. And granted to him, whether you like him or not, Olusha uh, Gonobasanjo was a patriot and he had a focus. Uh, he had his own weaknesses as a leader, uh, but he had a focus and he was committed to economic reforms and this served to really open up the economy. And, you know, people felt there is a future and there is, a, there is, there is hope. He had a vision of what the country should be. Uh, unfortunately, I think we've lost that vision. Number one, there is no peace in this country anymore. And uh, uh, we are seeing killings. And that is where I disagree with Bugaji. There is nothing like farmers' herders' clashes. If you are a farmer living on your, on your farm, and people come with sophisticated guns, many of them from Niger and Mali. They're not even Nigerians. And they start attacking you, attacking your family. Where is the clash? There's no clash. Yeah, but the, 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 no the historical antecedents of all of this. Even the, even the, the, the nations are coming together, no. you know, the, the issue of uh, pastoralist farmers, I mean, uh, um, complex. No, 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 no. If I should speak some bit of Arabic. <laughs> right. It's not that. Okay. People have been living with herdsmen for thousands of years. They have even intermarried. In my hometown in Sangha, local government of Kaduna State, people, they, they fully speak our language. They are part of the community. That is not what we are talking about at all. There is a new breed of strangers 
Okay. Even from their accent, they are not Nigerians. Mm. They are very wicked. They are very heartless. Mm. They kill. They rape. Mm. And they have very sophisticated weapons. Yeah, if I understand you, you are looking, yeah. at, looking at the dynamic yeah. so, now. Exactly. So, mm. it's nothing to do with the traditional. Look, a cow enters your farm, you get annoyed, you go to the Uruga, you find the guy, he apologizes, he gives you some money. Yeah. And you in some cases, issue. even traditional institutions wait in. Traditional institutions wait in. It, uh, it is nothing to do with that, in my view. Absolutely nothing to do with the traditional clashes that are normal. You know? So, uh, and that, you know, part of way of living. But what we are having today is something else. And I believe that some politicians know more about it than they are prepared to tell us. Okay, I was actually about to ask you, so where, where is it actually coming from? How, where, where is the loophole? Because if this uh, criminals are said mm -hmm. to, to be invading the country from outside, yes. how do they get into the country? What well, is the motive and all of that? Well, I think it is lands, it is conquest, it is territory, okay. and it is hegemony. Yeah. And to be honest with you, it is bordering on genocide. If you look at the, the thrust of the killings, the way it is done, uh, and uh, so it, it is, and it is, it has destroyed completely mm. any trust that existed among the northern peoples. Mm. But, but, is it, but, uh, but it, does it affect only a section? Because if we're talking about the menace of these criminals, yes. Yes. you know, it cut across uh, all the tribes. Is exactly. that the same problem, uh, you know, a farmer well, is facing in Plateau, for instance, or in Saraba? Yes. The same challenge a farmer in Sokoto or in Zambara is facing. That is true. Invasion of his farm, killing no, here and there. No, and but yes, the scale is not quite the same. Oh, Malaysia, if you let us be very honest to ourselves. Yes. The, the scale is not the same, and the duration is not the same. Okay. Uh, except uh, Bermungwari mm. and Zambara. And that has to do with even two issues. Mm. There's an element of ethnicity. Okay. Uh, the indigenous peoples, mm. uh, you know, Moguzawa, Moguzawa and the rest. Mm. Uh, and uh, then it also has to do with um, resource conflict. Mm. Economy. There's gold there. Mm. And a lot of banditry is to create an environment mm. where they can take all the gold. And many of the MAs and the governors have bought huge chunks of these lands and have alienated a lot of people. So it has generated all kinds of social problems. But I can tell you, as somebody who loves the North, and somebody who loves our country, without bias to religion, to ethnicity, and as an economist, to me, poverty is poverty. A poor mother who cannot support her children Mm. in the rural village of Dabiran, where I grew up, I was in the far, far from Dora, mm. uh, on the border with Niger. To, to me, her plight worries me mm. as much as the plight that my mother would have been concerned with. Mm. So, so, but mm. the way our leaders have practiced the politics mm. of exclusion, mm. the politics of apartheid and discrimination, mm. it has generated, it has destroyed completely the mm. trust mm. that existed. And it is extending to the rest of the country, you know? Mm. Uh, and uh, so, anyway. Mm. Part uh, also uh, boils down to the issue of the leadership recruitment process we're talking about. That is very true. Come back to that. And, mm. you know, Bugaja also spoke about national consensus. And that yeah. is what is also very important. Look, if we had a national consensus mm. that I mentioned the case of the, the woman and her baby in Dora. Mm. Her, her plight concerns me, mm. uh, uh, first and foremost, before anything else. And if we leaders can feel like that about the whole country, then we have a basis to begin serious discussion, to say, look, what should be the national agenda? Mm. But how do we build, yeah? But how do we build the national consensus in an atmosphere where ethnicity, religion, and mm -hmm. even political interests yes are seem to be driving you know our national consciousness? 
exactly. That's why do we drive that? What what I don't know what you mean uh, by political interest. Mm. A, a politician who has never studied Plato or Aristotle, mm. who is a complete ignorant compound failure intellectually, mm. claims to have interests, mm. and those interests to me are not important. Mm. Uh, 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 That's not important. It, yeah, we can claim to have interests. I don't care about his interests. Mm. There is a national interest, mm. and that is the interest of Nigeria as a country. Mm. There's some yeah, there's some country. You know, personal interest, sectional interest, or political interest. Or well, interest. that is the difference between politicians and statesmen. Statesmen or statespeople, statesmen, stateswomen, are people who are able to subordinate personal interest for the interest of the common good of all the people. Literacy, education skills development, job creation, poverty eradication, infrastructures, and building on the foundation of peace and social justice. Right. Fundamental. When somebody like Yakubu Gawan was president of this country, why is it that those issues didn't come up? No, there was no question of seeing him as mm. somebody who was a sectional leader. Yeah, and who was, uh, yes. I was yeah. And mm. Yakubu Gawan was a patriot, is a patriot and a nationalist. Of course, I don't like military regimes, mm. but they were there. And there are, there are people who can help us create a national agenda. So who are, who are these people? Because that is a fundamental question. Oh, no, no, no. You know, oh. Brigadier is talking about yes. the, the elite, you know, yes. they are in the national discussion, or the national sure. consensus. Sure. And, and perhaps these are same, you know, people who are also benefiting from 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 the the, the, the fault lines we are talking about. So how would they drive any national consensus? Consensus. Well, you are right. They are benefiting from the fault lines, and uh, they are milking the fault lines. Uh, and of course, in the process, uh, they are in line to destroy our country. And to be honest with you, uh, they don't realize that. And Bugaja made the reference to population by 2030. Yeah, we are commenting that. Uh, and so on. Yeah, the point I'm making is that, to be honest, at the rate we are going, mm. in the next 20 years, uh, this country cannot survive it. Without perhaps proper planning, because the, if the country will collapse and disintegrate without a doubt. Look, I did some simple input output analysis with students from the University of Ibadan mm. using systems theory. Put in all the issues that we are facing in this country banditry, genocide, killings, kidnappings, and so kidnapping, kidnapping. Criminality, insurgency. corruption, mm. insurgency, mm. distrust, exclusion, nepotism. Put all these things and instability in one basket. Put those things into a, in a system mm. and see that, and the system itself is very weak mm. and with an institutionally uh, comatose. Mm. And see what the output will be over time. No system can survive that. Mm, yes, so, so, so the time so is honestly speaking, mm. we are sitting on a time bomb mm. and we are behaving as if we live in normal times. Mm. We live in very abnormal times. That is why some of us and, and and I'm not here to orchestrate my own political, you know, mm. ambitions or whatever. Right. Uh, uh, we are talking as, as an economist, as public mm. intellectual, mm. and and uh, to be honest with you. Mm. Unless we wake up, mm. we might just wake up and find that this country cannot survive it. Mm. Yeah, L looking at the projections mm. now, yes. in the next 10 years, Nigeria would be, uh, is expected to, to hit 300 million yes. you know, in terms of population. Just yeah. the next, just next 10 years. Yes. This, you know, is a huge challenge. It is. And it is coming at the time we're battling with declining economic fortunes. Sure. You know, Coming uh, occasioned by inability of our respective, I mean, the leadership to also think out of the box, or perhaps change the narrative, or yes. you know, do things that would ordinarily change, mm -hmm. change what is what is on ground. 
So planning is essential now. Sure. Uh, even though the government, to some extent, would tell you that, yes, it is looking at some of this, um, perhaps looking at how it can also, while the po population is growing, looking at how it can lift, you know, people out of poverty and all of that. Yes. We're talking about over 70% now, below mm -hmm. poverty line. Yes. And taking this huge number, mm -hmm. 100 billion, mm -hmm. out of poverty, you know, is, will be a critical challenge for the sure. government. So, uh, we wouldn't say that the government is not perhaps maybe thinking along this line, but looking at the explosion in terms of population and what we have on ground, perhaps that is what raised the concern. I mean, what brought about the concern that uh, we are sitting on a cake of gunpowder? To be honest with you, you see the way that the government, we are sure the government is thinking. Number one, the government has no brains. Hmm. Uh, so if you have no brains, you cannot be thinking. Hmm. We have no leadership, we have no brains. And there is no thinking. So I think all this development so, uh, that has been put on, on ground, I just, just they don't opinion. believe a word of it. They don't believe it. Mm. They don't practice it. And they did it just to fulfill a righteousness. Mm. I'm sorry to be harsh like this. Mm. And I do so out of my love for the country. Mm. To be honest with you, they don't believe it. They don't even understand it. Mm. And uh, we are just heading towards mm. God knows what. It, it, it's a very bleak, very, very, very bleak scenario. Because, let me be very honest with you, anywhere, any organization, even a family, when a father is a loving and a responsible father, you find the atmosphere of the house very different or the mother, or whoever. Mm -hmm. If I'm sure the secondary school you went to, immediately a new principal came. There was a change in the atmosphere. The environment, really. Yes, mm -hmm. and that translates into a lot of things, even to the performance of the students. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the atmosphere we're getting, the vibes we're getting are not good. Encouraging now. No, they are not encouraging. Mm -hmm. We don't feel that we have leaders that love the people. Mm -hmm. We don't feel we have leaders that believe, even in the country. They don't believe in the country. They believe in what they want to believe. Mm -hmm. It's sectional, it's parochial, mm -hmm. it is egocentric, it is self-centered, mm -hmm. and it is self-destructive. Uh. That atmosphere alone mm. has created a very bleak scenario such that mm. business people, both foreign and in, uh, internal, mm. they are holding back whatever cash they have. Mm. And if you look at it carefully, a lot of people are transferring their money from Naira to dollars and they are hiding it mm. because they don't know what will happen to Nigeria. Nobody believes in Nigeria anymore. Mm. How would all the, the the transformation that is going on, you know, in the, in the real sector, I mean, in, in, the, in the infrastructure, in, in power, you know, in doing businesses and all of that. So all of this is not getting the the confidence of the investors. I would My say. Is, have you, you need to tell that to the American Marines and they will believe you. Mm. There is no peace in Nigeria. Mm. There is no peace. Look, during these holidays, a lot of people are not leaving Abuja unless to travel by air. Try going this Kaduna road, mm. and you're holding your breath. There's uh, some level of uh, sanity, some calmness, you know, in the last three months. Uh, until the closure of the borders, mm. which uh, actually I support. People, people get, I, my friends in Lagos get annoyed mm. when I tell them I support the government's mm. decision to close the borders, mm. because it is it has restored some elements of sanity. Mm. So I would not say everything, and of course, arise. Mm. There's a lot of investments mm. in, 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 in right, domestic rice production were almost self-sufficient. Mm. This is something good that the government yeah. has done. Professor Bugadi, I mean, was, uh, Dr. Bugadi was actually talking, uh, talking about, you know, yeah. the, the, the proliferation of arms. I'm sure you saw it. About yes. 500 million weapons that get their way into the West African countries. 70% of all of that comes into they Nigeria. They are coming to Nigeria. Mm. People are gathering arms mm. because they don't know what will happen tomorrow. And there are all kinds of terrifying rumors mm. going all over the place. Mm. Look, if a 
become a leader. Mm. And people have become so terrified. I have to sit down and ask myself some very hard questions as to whether mm. I have the competence to lead a country like this. Mm. Because but right now, nobody believes in Nigeria. There is no peace anywhere. Mm. There's a deep feeling of anxiety and existential fear that this country, anything can happen any day. Mm. And that is a very mm. dangerous thing. Yeah, so how do, we, how do we restore the confidence of the people? Because fundamentally we've had, we've had you know, countries who yes. have gone through similar situations sure. like ours. He yes. was raising the, the, the example of uh, Rwanda, for instance. Yes. How Rwanda was able to rise mm -hmm. from that, uh, I mean, very uh, terrible, mm -hmm. you know, situation mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where hundreds and hundreds of people were killed, you know. And well, this country rise and was able to build that national, mm -hmm. I mean, consciousness, if you yes. like, that national consensus. Sure. A country was set on the roadmap of development. Yes. Not necessarily looking back at what happened. Exactly. So how do we restore this confidence? Well, we need, well, we must, uh, I mean, <coughs> that leads to a very simple answer. Mm. You need a Paul Kagame. Mm. You need somebody with the qualities of Paul Kagame. Uh, you know, uh, who, number one, is a nationalist, mm. and he's a patriot, mm. and he's absolutely fearless, and he doesn't approach issues from the mm. viewpoint of sentiments. Mm. That is what you need. Yeah. But I need to also correct the impression, you talked about, you, in spite of all the infrastructures, mm. but which infrastructures are we talking about? Mm. Well, we'll be hearing about millions and millions of dollars that have been uh, borrowed from that is very uh, to, to, to finance uh, uh, rail projects, uh, roads, and all of that. So where are the rail projects? Where are the, you know... Uh, a friend from Mambila mm. told me recently, say, look, you've been hearing they're talking about this Mambila Hydro. They have not put even one block there. Yeah, I think one of the, the, the ministers has confirmed that. You know, in the, in, the, in the coming of the, the second coming so, of the... So where, did the so where did the billions of dollars go into? What happened to the billions of dollars? See, this is the kind of thing that frightens the daylights out of me. Mm. You cannot borrow and then waste it. It's very dangerous. Because, you know, uh, given the actual realities, mm. yeah, uh, uh, you know, people are not going to live forever. And you're not going to just collect so much loans and then after 2023 you leave people to be crying. And there is a donation. So, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't run an economy like that. So, I am not seeing the infrastructures. They are boring heavily. And, uh, and I wrote an article the other day and I said, look, I'm not against borrowing. I said, banker cannot sit here and say, don't borrow. But, there are two conditions. In fact, three conditions. Number one, you must never borrow for consumption. Mm -hmm. You must borrow for projects, and those projects must be viable, viable and have guaranteed a return on investments. Mm -hmm. And you must put in place structures to ensure mm -hmm. that the money is used for that purpose. And if there are lapses. You deal with them scrupulously. That is how you implement projects. Yeah, talking about leadership qualities. You, exactly. you, you did say that you know what is lacking is perhaps uh, people who have you know that nationalism, yes. them, fearlessness. Yes, you know exactly. People who are just in their approach to issues sure. and all of that. Sure. When the present administration came on board. There, there has been this uh, consensus among Nigerians that, uh, uh, one, looking at the man at the helm of affairs, President Muhammad Buhari, mm -hmm. came with that integrity. Nigerians saw him with that. Mm -hmm. um, he was seen to be a nationalist mm -hmm. because of his concern about Nigeria's development. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that is perhaps what, what has led to his kind of um, uh, fell out, you know, falling out with, mm -hmm. with the, the political elites then. Some see him as one who has the masses at heart, uh, fearless in mm. his approach to issues. Mm. Um, you know, you recall when he came on board, people say just the body language, his 
Nigerians to begin to behave and all of that. Mm-hmm. We've seen how power was stabilized within mm-hmm. the shortest mm-hmm. possible time. We've seen how people who are corrupt have, have became jittery and all of that. Looking back at that period and today, yeah. how are we going to place, where would you say, uh, you know, all of this, how can you situate all of this? Does, mm-hmm. does this still exist? Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, uh, and my reader, uh, my our viewers will be maybe interested to know this, that I joined the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies oh. in 1982, just barely at 22, 23 years of age, oh. and uh, as a fellow research fellow there, oh. beautiful campus if you've been there, we had excellent sports facilities, oh. and there was a gentleman, oh. an officer. Who used to drive himself, he would come to the campus and then he would play sports with us. He was the GOC of Rukuba Barracks, which was just not far. And that gentleman was Muhammad Buhari. We used to play sports together and a wonderful gentleman. And if you see him, you will be very proud of the Nigerian army. Gallant officer, focused intelligent, smart. This was the Muhammad Buhari some of us knew, even before he became known to the country. Mm. Past past 82. Yes, Mm. and we loved him. Mm. And of course by December 31st, we heard the news that he had become president, head of state of the country. And of course we all rejoiced. And this started off very well. Um, But I was seeing signs of certain things not right. You know, it is not enough to say you are incorruptible. Uh It is not enough to even say you love the people. You must have the system in place to uh, exercise leadership and authority. Because if you are president and if you are commander-in-chief, the buck stops with you. You cannot Uh, hive off off Uh power. Uh And to be honest, he hived off a lot of the power that he had. That is why the regime was called Uh Buhari Diabo. Uh And that that was good and they worked together very well but to be honest with you I had my doubts about the intellectual competence of the whole system okay and from 1983 84 till today there's no evidence that he went to school to improve himself there's no evidence that he has developed himself beyond that level so it's not about he, the struggle, you know, to um, to get power. The, he, he was uh, first. He came first at uh, I think it was 2003 or thereabout. Yeah. 2007, 2011, yes. and subsequently 2019. So with all of that, you think he hasn't learned? I mean, he hasn't possessed the necessary. Uh, he hasn't equipped himself with the necessary skills or the competence to drive the country. But. Because you're in political struggle doesn't mean that you've developed yourself. You've only struggled and eventually you, you got it. Mm. Huh? And it, it doesn't mean that in the process that you've developed yourself. I mean, I need to have evidence of that. Mm. And I'm sorry, I have not seen the evidence. And in reality, in life, mm. you can only give what you have. And I'm sorry, mm. there's no much there to give anything. You're talking about intellectual capacity, but what about the leadership, leadership capacity? Even the leadership capacity. Look, mm. we live in a digital age. Their age was totally different. Okay? It was not. We live in a digital computer age. You cannot have off leadership. Mm. You cannot. The buck stops with you if you are commander-in-chief. And you are always handing over to others to run the government, and you are sitting back like a caliph. But I am sorry for you. Mm. I am sorry for it, you. But is it, is it deliberate, it, doctor? Sorry? Is it deliberate? I don't know. I don't know whether it is deliberate or not. Mm. To me, that is leadership failure. 
I am sorry to say. Mm. If I am to run this country, mm. wallahi tallahi, people must sit up. If money is voted for something, I will go with my korokoro eyes to see it. Mm. You cannot just be having off and delegating. You see, people don't eat goodness. Mm. People don't eat goodness. Mm. They eat what you are able to provide for them. Mm. Yeah, but doctor, some will tell you, <coughs> governing a country like Nigeria is a Herculean task. Yes. A, a complex country like Nigeria, you're talking about 200 million people with diverse ethnic, religious, honestly, political... Nigeria is the interest. simplest country to govern, believe mm. you me. Mm. I have traveled to almost 100 countries mm. in the course of my professional career. I worked in banking and finance and international development. I can tell you, Nigeria is one of the simplest countries to govern. Mm. So what, what should... Forget about all this. We have our division, Arewa, Odudua, Biafra, and so on. Mm. These are symptoms of an underlying something that is missing. Mm. They have never had a patriot. Mm who in his heart mm. has love for everybody 100%. They don't have that. If people know that they have a leader that is not discriminatory, that loves the country equally, and is there to work for the country, mm. he will say, look, Ariya, what is your comparative comparative advantage. advantage right. Most of the food is grown there. Mm. Most of the livestock is grown there. I will mm. turn, I will create an agro-industrial revolution. Mm. If I go to Igbo land, mm. uh, Nnewi and all those areas, what else you, are, you like making heavy industry industrialization. and so yeah. industrialization, mm. we we'll open automobiles, we we'll open all of these things. Mm. If I go to Lagos, there's finance, there's logistics, we we'll develop those areas. You develop areas based on their yeah, advantage. Advantage. Mm. And then you link the country together mm. and you bring key people. Don't choose queer queer people. Hmm. Choose people of the highest caliber. Hmm. Perhaps the, 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 there should be political patronage now. <laughs> there will always be. Look, no, because largely it's, it's because of that. You no, find people coming because we're, of we're, their contributions. That, to yes, the, you can do patronage. You can do patronage intelligently by bringing some of the best people. Hmm. Bugatti is one of the best we have in the north. Why is nobody even considering him for anything? Yes, several of them. He talked exactly. about it. You know. So it yeah. is the kind of things we are talking about. Yeah. And so Nigeria is a very simple country. I can tell you, yeah. once people know you are sincere, yeah. once people know that you are focused, once people know you are nationalistic, once people know that you even have the intellectual capacity, yeah. I am telling you, they will make way for you. Yeah, and they will support you. Doctor. But does the system corrupt? Because some are looking at the system generally. It, it's yes. very difficult to cleanse. Yes. Once you look at it from outside, but once you come in, you find out it's a dip, different terrain altogether. Yes. Sometimes you have to give up. I can tell you, no, 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 no. Somebody like me, hmm. if the system is bad, I will change that system. I will, I, I will do it. Is it. I have the way to change the system. Look, as a leader, one leader can make a huge difference. You know that the people, the America, the people are talking about, only 12 people built America. 12. Uh, um, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. They were not more than 12. They didn't like each other all the time, but they had certain basic principles mm. and they agreed on a basic consensus on how to make America great. Yes. They wanted a prosperous country, mm. they wanted a democracy, they wanted a constitutional framework that will work and be fair and representative. Mm. What is wrong with somebody, and you know I can tell you, mm. where you are hammering on the system and the system is that. Mm. Very Terrible people find themselves in power. Most of them were failures at school. Okay? The first thing they look for is people who are like themselves or below. Okay? It takes
takes a brilliant person to acknowledge other brilliant people and to bring them. And I'm sorry I'm not emphasizing this act of arrogance. The complexity of 21st century industrial technological civilization does not require people who are school failures. It requires people of the highest intellectual capital. You can never give what you don't have. And you need to bring in the brightest people. Pay them well. Pay them fairly. Okay? I mean, in, in, uh, in Singapore, permanent secretaries earn up to a million dollars. Pay them well. I say, look, this is the land we are growing. We are paying you well. You live comfortably, but you must deliver. You have to deliver. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the basic. You must deliver. Mm-hmm. Look, if we did that mm-hmm. in this country, put our best first 11 forward, mm-hmm. and tell them, look, we, we, we don't have too much to pay you. We are still a developing country. So you will all, we all need to sacrifice. Mm-hmm. I know myself mm-hmm. that I don't need to steal money from anywhere. If I created a new Nigeria, made the country great, mm. I know that even if, if I'm not alive, mm. my children will not suffer. Mm. You're looking at the uh, yes. posterity, you're looking at exactly. the future. Uh, okay. So, yeah. what are we afraid of? Mm. But how do we get to that? Because fundamentally, just like Bugaji has said, there is something wrong with the leadership recruitment process. Yes. Today, election is not based on competence is not based on intellectual capacity, just like you said. Yes. Even Nigerians are no longer interested in all of that that you're no. talking about. They're, look, they're no. interested in who will bring out money. Exactly. Who will bring out money. And this is a product, a byproduct of the, all the consequences of the, the, the level of poverty, the endemic poverty we are, we're in, for instance. So how do we, first of all, conscientize the, the electorate, mm. drive a leadership recruitment, recruitment process, you know, on the basis of competence, uh, capacity, and all of that. How do we do that in the first place? You know, it's interesting. I'll give you an example of uh, Obafemi Mia mm. When he was released from prison in 1967, mm. and he was made Minister of Finance and uh, Deputy, uh, virtually de facto Vice President. Mm. Uh, Gawan placed him in charge of the financial system. We fought the Afra war. After the war, there was a massive program of reconstruction. Right. You know what Awole War did? Mm. Awole War took all the money, put it in the treasury, and locked the key, and put the key in his mm. drawer. Mm. Even the president, to get money, must justify it. Must justify it based on agreed budget plans. And do you know what happened? Throughout the Civil War, Nigeria did not borrow one dollar. And throughout the whole post-war reconstruction, the rebuilding of the whole Southeast, Nigeria did not borrow one dollar. To me, that is leadership. So are we, are we, are we so, saying that... So people, people, wait, people, of course, you, you, you know, uh, people will always demand this, demand that, demand that. Uh, there are certain things, if you put a small amount of money, you know, to help for charitable issues and emergencies and so on, that one is understandable. But you cannot open up your central bank. People come in there, take any amount of money to do whatever they like. I mean, if I went away, did not borrow one dollar for civil war. Why are we borrowing billions of dollars for Boko Haram? Which is nothing compared to the civil war that took place. Mm. Does it mean we have less intelligence than him? Mm. Or does it mean we are, in our spirit, very corrupt and, and terrible people? Mm. So, so is, is the system open, let open so, now? Is so it is this, a chorus for people to... The system is created by human beings. Mm. And the system can be changed by human beings. One man mm. who believes strongly... Mm can change Nigeria mm. by bringing together people who share the same philosophy. Mm. Bring them from Ariwa, bring them from Yoruba land, bring them from Ebola, bring them from everywhere, mm. put them together and say, gentlemen, mm. let's rebuild Nigeria. Yeah. And it will work. One must certainly lead the pack 
you know, just like you said. But then nationalism, instilling nationalism in the hearts and minds of Nigerians mm -hmm. is also very critical. Yes. You know, Professor Bugaji has talked about, you know, how some countries who have, who are where they are today, before now they were countries who are struggling also to, uh, to, to, to attain development. Yes. But because of that national consciousness, mm. consensus that was built, yes. and uh, which, uh, which is not likely, so to speak, with our present situation, mm -hmm. looking at the interests, you know, the varying interests of our political elites. Yes. Um, you know, like, I mean, country men realize that there is need to put the nation first. Mm -hmm. And then nationalism is instilled in the minds yes, of the people. Exactly. They do away with anything that will identify anyone with his ethnicity, religion, yes. or whatever. Nationalism was the focal point. Mm. In Nigeria, how do we come around, because the conversation today is around how do we jettison this, our uh, ethnicity, religion, and all of that that is drawing us back. How do we build that national mm, consensus? I think, I think, uh, Maren Shafi, your question is, uh, is a little bit, uh, you know, confusing. Uh, yes, because, n number one, mm. Nations are invented entities. Mm. They are not natural. Mm. All nations are inventions. Mm. So you can, as a statesman, deliberately construct a nation out of a confused situation. Mm. Through your greatness, through your focus, mm. and through your courage, mm. you can create a nation. Mm. Secondly, you are asking, how can we throw away... No, 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 no. Mm. Or no, it, but I mean, you, 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 which state are you from? No, if I be asked. I'm from Zamfara State. Yeah, you're from Zamfara. Mm. Lovely state. Mm. And you can be proudly Zamfara, proudly Muslim, uh, and proudly Nigerian. Mm. And my duty is to bring out the best in you. Mm. But of course, within the framework of our collective goal. Mm. that in fact our diversity should be a source of strength mm. but the question is rather than today, today we identify the people based on their ethnicity based yes. on their religion and exactly. all that. it is even established in our day to day um, activities you can't go to school without mentioning where you are from yes. you can't go to you can't get a job yes. without mentioning your state your origin yes. and all of that and what the, I mean people are saying today is that we don't need all of that you were citing an example of what is happening. We were, we were talking about uh, sure. Rwanda, for instance. Sure. And that Rwanda, this is the first thing they did. Sure. Was to do away with anything called ethnicity or where you come sure. from or whatever. They built consensus around nationalism. Yeah, that is That true. is my question. That is very true. Now, you can, you can, there are different ways of, do, of doing it. The situation in Rwanda was slightly different. Uh, they are not actually two different nations, uh, two different ethnicities. They are actually the, virtually the same people. They speak Kirundi, mm -hmm. so they, they speak uh, um, uh, uh, the same language. Uh, you know, uh, not Kirundi. Kirundi is the one in Burundi. Mm -hmm. um, Hutu and Tutsi. There's Hutu and Tutsi. Mm -hmm. It was mostly like a cultural a cultural groups okay. because they speak actually the same language, mm -hmm. uh, but. He has abolished the idea of Tutsi Hutu. Mm. You are all Rwandese. Mm. Is it, is it, um, is that it not possible? I mean, is it something that is not doable in Nigeria? Well, Nigeria is a very big country, and I don't think it is realistic. Mm. The issue is that we should not politicize it. I should not politicize mm. identity over and above our common Nigerian heritage. That in fact, I should feel very proud visiting the grave of uh, uh, of Sultan Bello in Sokoto and marvel at that great culture and the contributions it made to making what Nigeria is today. And I should feel the same thing about visiting Calabar and visiting uh, Ife to watch, you know, the great uh, cultural achievements or Edo, uh, the Bene Kingdom and so on. Mm -hmm. We should make them into something that we are proud of as a country mm -hmm. and actually use leverage on them to demonstrate to ourselves and to the world that 
our diversity is in fact our strength, not our weakness. But you see, when we begin to use it, to politicize it, and then to allocate all values based on where you come from, mm. then it becomes very destructive. Mm. And unfortunately, it's getting worse. Mm. You know, and when I was growing up, uh, uh, and uh, Salah we celebrated together, mm. Christmas that is coming, we celebrated together. Mm. Unfortunately, our children don't do that anymore. They don't do that anymore. Maybe. So, how can people who don't play together, eat together, mm. visit each other's houses, we even holiday in each other's homes? Right, right. But, you right. know, the current generation, we don't mm. do that. And, of course, it means mm. we are becoming strangers to mm. each other. Yes. And yes. once we become strangers mm. to each other, mm. it is difficult mm. to build a sense of nationhood. Yeah, L lastly, before we draw the curtain, mm. you know, mm. by 2050, Nigeria will be the third most populous nation in the world. Yes. This is a very huge task ahead of us. Mm -hmm. We talked about more than 80% below poverty line. Yes. We talked about 75% of our population, which is the youth population. Yes. Unemployed. Sure. Having no direction. In just 60 seconds, what needs to be done to arrest this, perhaps going into prison that we're talking about? Number one, having a huge population is not a bad thing. In fact, my optimal population for Nigeria should be 500 million. Mm. Because slavery destroyed a lot of our people. Colonialism mm. destroyed a lot of our people. So we, we are only recovering. Africa is only recovering its optimal population level. Mm -hmm. But beyond a certain level, we need to plan very well for our population and for especially the youths. Mm. We must create jobs, we must restructure the economy. We must mm. drive critical reforms mm. that will unleash the entrepreneurial energies of our people. But Simali Shafiu, mm. nothing can be done without the foundation of peace. There must be peace. Mm. But there cannot be peace without justice. Mm. So peace Mm. Justice, mm. economic reforms, strong leadership, mm. committed leadership, patriotic leadership, mm. nationalistic leadership. And also, mm. nobody talks about a reform of the, the, the civil service. Mm. Yes. A a civil we, service we, will we, always be the big elephant. Mm, yeah. so, we, we, so we have to reform it. Thank you very much. So, uh, all of that put together will take us out of the wood. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Obademi Lafia. Uh, a former deputy governor of the central bank, a development economist, and uh, a former, one time, or just a former uh, presidential candidate uh, in the just concluded uh, 2019 general election. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Really Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And his behalf on the technical crew and his uh, also, I have to appreciate his lovely wife who, you know, took the pain, you know, to drive him all the way <laughs> to be able to participate in Thank the you. program. We really appreciate it. <laughs> so Thank on you. his behalf and the yeah. technical crew, my name is Shabir Salaman. Do join us tomorrow where we shall come your way with another interesting topic and personality. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day.